Welcome, everybody, to this evening's uh, BISF lecture. It is uh, a great pleasure indeed for me to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Jan Rüger, um, a colleague from Birkbeck College, not from the literature department, but the history department. Um, he chaired it um, for many years. Um, Jan Rüger is um, a particularly welcome guest in our um, lecture series because he offers something which um, is rather rare, namely um, his specialism is amongst other things, the Anglo-German naval history um, as part of uh, the Anglo-German imperialist past. But um, uh, he also um, offers a very specific take on this aspect of um, our uh, common history, uh, what he calls a micro historical approach. That is to say, he has singled out um, in some publications, quite a number of publications, a particular geographical, topographical uh, element, namely the island of Helgoland. And um, he has uh, fascinatingly um, written, researched on the significance of this highly contested island between England and Germany, or one should say perhaps Prussia, and one can add Denmark to a certain extent um, over the years and centuries. But um, he is not only an expert on this particular aspect of uh, our uh, coin joint history, he has also uh, co-edited a very important uh, volume on the meaning of history or rather the historiography after uh, Hobsbawm. That is to say, after an eminent figure who um, in so many ways shaped also the meaning of history in the curriculum of Birkbeck, but also in our overall perception. And uh, this volume is called History After Hobsbawm, Writing the Past for the 21st Century. The volume I mentioned earlier on, um, published in 2017 on Helgoland, uh, is called Britain, Germany, and a Struggle for the North Sea. Um, that's at Oxford University Press. Um, I cannot possibly um, quote all of uh, the numerous publications that you'll find uh, not just on uh, Jan Rüger's website, but hopefully also in the library. Um, but I would like to point out that um, when I look at his approach, one could almost call him an equivalent, and I hope I'm forgiven for this, Jan, um, an equivalent to um, Ferdinand Bordel, because Bordel, as you know, focused on maritime history as far as the Mediterranean is concerned. What I see before me in terms of um, material that I have read by Jan Rüger um, is in that sense, indeed the equivalent um, as far as the North is concerned, the North Sea as a contested area. So with all of that, I um, would like to welcome you again, uh, Jan Rüger, and invite you to talk to us on a truly exciting uh, topic, namely, Hamburg, as um, the German gate to the world, as they call themselves up there, Hamburg under Napoleonic occupation, Hamburg and its role in the Napoleonic Wars. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rüdiger, and, and everyone at the center for the, for the kind invitation and, and for the lovely introduction. Um, uh, it's the nicest compliment I, I have received in quite a while to be called the the, the, the Brodel of the North Sea. <laughs> I'm currently writing a book about the Anglo-German relationship, which ranges from the early 18th century uh, all the way to the present. So much more ambitious, if you like, uh, than, the, than the previous microhistory uh, that, that you mentioned. The book, um, I'm about halfway through, and it's meant to come out in 2025, I think. The book brings together the everyday experiences of those who live this relationship on the ground with the perspective of those in power. People have never stopped moving between 
the English and German speaking parts of Europe, and they are unlikely to do so in future. It is through their eyes as much as through the cockpits of power in London and Berlin that the book approaches the past three centuries. What I would like to talk about tonight, though, um, is a much smaller window, a, a small but important episode um, that is part of that much longer story, namely the time of the Napoleonic Wars, a series of conflicts that had contradictory effects on the relations between Britain and the various Germanies that existed in the early 19th century. We can see this particularly well when we focus on Hamburg, a fascinating microcosm of the Anglo-German relationship. So if I may invite you to uh, go back all the way to the autumn of 1806 <clears throat> and to set the scene um, since Prussia's defeat at Jena and Auerstedt on the 14th of October 1806, uh, there was no meaningful opposition to the French army left in the German lands. Napoleon was now at the zenith of his power. He lost no time in accelerating the reorganization reorganiz of Europe. On the 19th of November, his troops occupied Hamburg. Two days later, he introduced the continental system, effectively banning by decree, the Berlin decree is the legal instrument, banning by decree all trade between Britain and mainland Europe. Goods of British or colonial origin were now prohibited, not just in France, but in all occupied and allied countries. The continental system opened literally a new front in the war between France and Britain, with the German states wedged uncomfortably in between. Could the world's largest merchant empire be cut off from all trade with the continent, its most important market. This question was particularly pressing in Hamburg, by far the most important port through which Germans traded with Britons. Britain's merchants and manufacturers showed little interest in abandoning their lucrative markets in mainland Europe. For them, there was no need to choose between Europe and empire. Indeed, their prosperity, and as they argued, their country's prosperity, depended on not being forced to choose between Europe and empire. In the years that followed, they went to unimaginable lengths to circumvent Napoleon's continental system. Working closely with their counterparts in Northern Germany, they built a smuggling network which shipped staggering amounts of goods from Britain to Europe. We can reconstruct this contraband empire, if you like, through detailed accounts left behind by customs officers, diplomats and merchants. But perhaps the most compelling perspective is the view of those on the ground who experienced the smuggling firsthand. Marianne Prell, eight years old and the daughter of a Hamburg merchant, had no doubt where the rare fabrics were from which her uncle had locked away in a small room of her family's house. They were English Waren, English products, and hence forbidden. Since the arrival of French troops in Hamburg, it had become more difficult to hide such smuggled goods, but her uncle depended on the imports from Britain. The fine cloth he traded was in high demand. Prices had risen steeply since the introduction of Napoleon's ban. But Marianne's uncle had not taken any precautions. Other merchants routine, routinely bribed the French authorities and secured false certificates, declaring their goods to originate from outside Britain. One day, recalled his niece, between four and six gendarmes ap appeared suddenly to inspect our house. It did not take them long to discover her uncle's secret room. His entire holdings of fine cloth, including velvet and silk, were confiscated and brought to the Grasbrook, the stretch of land between the city walls and the river Elbe, where the French erected large bonfires. There, as she put it, all the beautiful pieces were burned. The scenes which young Marianne watched were repeated across Hamburg. The Hanseatic city had seen a rapid rise in trade with Britain since the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars. Hannibal Evans Lloyd, a philologist and translator from London who had settled in Hamburg in 1800, 
observed how the city, quote, became the emporium, the central point of the commerce of the North. The continental system was aim aimed to put an end to this, effectively cutting through the multitude of links between Hamburg's merchant classes and their trade partners in Britain. In January 1807, a delegation of senators, Hamburg's ruling patrician um, uh, class, went to meet Napoleon. They begged him to allow the city to continue to buy and sell British and colonial goods. Could they at least keep the goods that were already in the city. Napoleon showed no interest in their arguments. A large scale cat and mouse game followed in which Hamburg's merchants man managed by and large to circumvent the ban. Whoever was able to bribe French officials did. The rest lied to them and hid their imports as well as they could. Thus observed Lloyd, the trade of Hamburg became, quote, a regular system of smuggling carried on by perjury and, bar and bribery. The most common route taken by the smugglers was via Altena, just outside Hamburg, ruled um, uh, by Denmark, or rather the Danish king in, in personal union, uh, uh, which remained unoccupied so long as, as he cooperated with Napoleon. It was here, 15 minutes outside of Hamburg, that most of the goods shipped from Britain were landed. Small boats sailed at dusk or dawn by local fishermen who knew how to evade the French did most of the work. From Altona, the contraband was carried into Hamburg in small quantities by countless individual smugglers. Prominent amongst them were the café träger, coffee couriers, who appeared soon in literary accounts. As General uh, Charles uh, Antoine Morin, the, the military governor of the city, explained to the French Minister of War, the smuggling was carried out, quote, by women, children, young girls, old people, and the lowest class of the population. Each of them, he said, carried half a pound of sugar and coffee, which they hide into their boots, shoes, and clothing. It was the task of the douanier to stop them. Marianne Prel remembered them, quote, with their dark green uniform and tri triangular black hats. They insisted that even her grandmother was searched for contraband when she traveled outside the city. Once the smuggled goods had arrived in Hamburg, they were sold on, some for local consumption, most to be re-exported to the rest of the continent. The goods which left Hamburg this way were routinely accompanied by certificates which stated that they were not of British origin. Some of these so-called passports were simply forged but more commonly, they had been signed by French officials. Louis-Antoine Favre de Bourrienne, a, a, a French consul, the highest ranking official in Hamburg, himself participated in the fraud. In exchange for a handsome commission, he countersigned the declarations, um, declarations that goods had not come via Britain. All this made him rich until Napoleon put a stop to it in December 1810, recalling him and incorporating Hamburg and the other Hanseatic cities into the French Empire. In many ways, Hamburg's experience under French occupation mirrored the Franzosen side, so-called, in other parts of Germany. Yet the ways in which the Hamburgers kept up with the shifting political order had an unusually strong Anglo-German character. It was as if the entire city lived in a field of tension between France and Britain, controlled by the one, but economically dependent on the other. No one documented this conflict-driven state better than Ferdinand Benecke, the Hamburg lawyer and later politician who, as some of you will know, kept a remarkable diary for more than 50 years of his life. Throughout the many hundreds of pages that he filled during the, the Napoleonic uh, era, there is a strong sense of Hamburg's social fabric being pulled apart. Watching yet another bonfire of confiscated British goods, he lamented the continuous war fought by the French against Hamburg citizens, all the, quote, violence and large-scale plundering. Everyone in the city seemed compromised by this, quote, ongoing circle of smuggling and police searches the lying and bribing, the spying and denunciating that were part of the clandestine trade were corroding all established norms. The Hamburgers' mor morals were, quote, rotting away. 
While the lower class is engaged in petty crime, the moral compass of Hamburg's merchants was broken in a more fundamental way. The only thing they seemed interested in was material gain. He had no doubt that the smuggle was necessary. Simply to cease trading with Britain would have meant, quote, ruin for us. But did Hamburg's middle classes have to throw th themselves quite so demonstratively at the feet of the British? Their heads were full of talk about die geliebten englischen Handelsfreunde, the beloved uh, English trading partners. The majority of citizens, quote, cling to England. Coming back from a dinner party at a merchant's house, he was full of contempt. Quote, for these people, Germany is, they admitted with a shrug of their shoulders, nothing, and England, everything. He explained this partly with Hamburg's traditionally close links to Britain. One could find more alt Englishes, he called it, in Hamburg than in other Hanseatic cities. Yet the Hamburgers' love for Britain seemed mostly motivated by greed. There was nothing great or philosophical in their attitude. It was a mere commercial calculation. Binnecke called it Bare Kaufmannssinn, that drove them into Britain's arms. What they lacked was an appreciation of everything genial, intellectual, passionate, emotional. They were almost like the British themselves. As acerbic as Benike was in his criticism of Hamburg's um, uh, merchant classes and their subservient love of Britain, he was honest about his own ambivalent position. His worldview was strongly influenced by romanticism and idealism. It had been focused on France and the revolution. Like so many in Germany's liberal, educated middle classes, he had deeply admired Napoleon as an enlightened genius who had captured the spirit of revolution. For remarkably long, Benecke held on to this belief, the belief that Napoleon would relinquish his extraordinary political powers once he had safeguarded the Republic against its enemy. He will surely step back into the rank of a simple citizen before long, he wrote still in February 1801. Hand in hand with this enthusiasm for Napoleon had gone a sincere dislike of the British, who had been the main reason, in Benecke's eyes, why Republican France had to struggle so much on the international stage. All this changed when Napoleon began to betray the ideals of the revolution. One moment was crucial for Benecke, Napoleon's attempt to suppress liberty in Saint-Domingue, Haiti. Uh, in August 1791, an insurrection broke out in the north of the French colony. Under the leadership of François-Dominique uh, Toussaint Louverture, uh, this expanded into a fully-fledged rebellion. Commanding an army made up mostly of formerly enslaved men, Louverture achieved the abolition of slavery in Saint-Domingue. In February 1794, the National Convention in Paris, the Revolutionary Par Parliament, um, followed this up by abolishing slavery in all French colonies. Britain, in, in the meantime, had begun a campaign to gain control over the French colony. Between 1793 and 98, um, uh, Prime Minister Pitt and his cabinet sent close to 40,000 troops there, um, essentially to enlarge Britain's national wealth and, and security, as, as he explained. Louverture was instrumental in repelling them. Saint-Domingue was thus a shining example for liberals like Benecke, the beacon of a new age. Slavery, still upheld by the British, was coming to an end. But once in power, Napoleon seemed determined to reverse all this. In October 1801, he ordered a military expedition uh, against the colony. Three months later, a force of 20,000, led by his brother-in-law, uh, General Victoire Leclerc, landed in the colony. After bitting, bitter fighting, they captured Louverture and deported him, uh, as well as his family, to France, where he eventually died in a military prison. In parallel, Napoleon began to restore slavery in France's colonies. It was a watershed for Benecke and many like-minded uh, liberals in the German lands. As he wrote in his diary, he lost his belief in Napoleon the day he read about uh, the, the the abolition, um, uh, the, the 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 day he read about the expedition against Saint Domingue. He was jubilant 
when the French attempt to subjugate the rebellious colony ended in defeat. In January 1804, Louverture's successor, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, declared Haiti independent and abolished slavery for good. A new revolution had succeeded by defeating, defeating the regime that had betrayed the original French Revolution at a staggering cost. As many as 50,000 lives had been lost on the French side, but twice as many amongst people of color from Saint-Domingue, a fifth of the population. I hate the Corsican, that is Napoleon, now like I have never hated a tyrant before, Benneke wrote in his diary on the 6th of March, 1804. The longer the war dragged on, the more did Benneke's hatred against Napoleon grow. In parallel, he came round to accepting that Britain was, for political and economic reasons, the main hope Hamburg had. More and more of his contemporaries were making the journey across the North Sea now in search of income or to fight against Napoleon, often both. Geht nach England, is leaving for England, became a regular entry in his diary. One morning in May 1804, he discovered that his servant had left for London with some of the Benneke's valuables. Several of his closest friends went to Britain in the years that followed. Then, in June 1809, his brother, Johann Friedrich, left. Their father had given him what he could afford in cash and checks. It was risky, Benneke thought, to let his brother go with the family savings, but it would have been even worse, quote, to let him waste yet another year of his best years without a prospect here in Hamburg. Benneke hoped that once in London, his brother would find his luck, quote, in this central point of the world's peaceful traffic. By now, Benneke was working actively within a covert network of Northern German patriots towards a British supported uprising against Napoleon. One of his confidants was Ludwig von Finke, later a leading Prussian reformer who hoped to connect his plans for a resurrection with a broader Prussian rebellion. In May 1807, Benecke saw him off as he left via Hamburg for London. The journey took Finke 13 days. It was, quote, a very happy feeling, he wrote when he arrived, to have escaped the detested French and find myself again on the lucky island that is Britain. Finke met with George Canning, the foreign secretary, who asked him to draw up a list of what he would need for a rebellion against Napoleon. There was hope that a broad insurrection in the German lands could be organized across the North Sea. Finke was busy scheming with political exiles from several other states when news of the peace of Tilsit reached London. On 7th of July, Alexander I signed a treaty with Napoleon. Two days later, Frederick William III followed suit. It was a deeply humiliating settlement, especially so, so for Prussia, which lost as much as half of its territory. There was no hope now for an Anglo-Prussian Anglo alliance, let alone a general German uprising against France. In August, Finke left London, quote, the great center of the world, disillusioned. To him, Benecke and many more Northern German patriots, it seemed clear that Britain and Pr Prussia had missed uh, the opportunity to work together against Napoleon. Tilsit cemented the situation Britain's leaders had strenuously sought to avoid, the continent dominated by one power, Britain isolated and without a strong ally in mainland Europe. There was no other option than to engage in small-scale cl clandestine campaigns until the day when a new coalition against Napoleon could be forged. It fell to Canning, the foreign secretary, to organize this war in which guineas and gunpowder played the key roles. Covert operations designed to destabilize Napoleon's rule and pull parts of Germany away from French domination, readying them for rebellion until a larger campaign against Napoleon could be organized. Hamburg was the most important entry point which the British used for this clandestine war. The French had no doubt that the city was the gateway through which Britain conducted espionage and covert operations. Even before Napoleon decided to occupy the city, he tried to put an end to the activities of the British. In the night from the 24th to the 25th of October 1804, 
French troops entered the city, special forces, you would call them these days, and forced their way into the home of George Rumbold, the British representative at the Hanseatic cities. They confiscated his papers and abducted him to Paris, where he was imprisoned and interrogated. Amongst the British diplomats who carried on in Hamburg was Edward Nicholas, who had close links with the city's Anglo-German merchants. In May 1805, he was joined by Sir Edward Thornton, Rumbold's replacement. Relying on a sprawling network of informants, Thornton and Nicholas were busy supplying London with intelligence while Napoleon's army closed in on Hamburg. Eventually, they moved their headquarters to Holstein, ruled by the Danish king and still neutral, just in time before the first French troops entered Hamburg on the 19th of November, 1806. For nine more months, they held out there. On the 11th of August, 1807, with the French about to occupy Holstein too, Thornton thought, quote, it my duty to hasten to England. England. All British vessels had left the Dutchies' ports a week earlier, but he and his staff found a boat that took them out into the bay. In the years that followed, this became the main route taken by the spies, agents and couriers who conducted the covert Anglo-German campaign against Napoleon. Much of this traffic was orchestrated by Edward Nicholas. In February 1808, six months after he had fled from Hamburg across uh, the North Sea, he was on his way back across uh, uh, the same um, uh, sea. George Canning, the foreign secretary, had appointed him on what he called a special mission. Taking up residence in Heligoland, Britain's North Sea outpost, Nicholas was in charge of the government's European correspondence. For the next four years, it was through him that King and Cabinet were informed about the course of the Napoleonic Wars. But Nicholas's mission went well beyond ensuring that the government could still communicate with whoever it wanted to reach on the continent. He effectively became the linchpin in Britain's covert campaign against Napoleon. He ran a network of informants and agents, conducted counterintelligence operations, which occasionally involved the disappearance of French agents. He organized the transport of troops and armaments. He made secret payments to allies and insurgents, and he orchestrated pro-British propaganda. Few of his contacts on the continent knew Nicholas by his real name. And those who did were under strict instructions not to use it in any correspondence. By far the most important of these confidants were John and Charles Parrish, merchant bankers and brothers in Hamburg. Their father have moved, had moved from Edinburgh to the Hanseatic city in the mid 18th century. His banking business, Parrish and Co, had made him one of Hamburg's richest men. His luxurious lifestyle was proverbial. Parrish Leben became a Hamburg idiom for sparing no expenses. As early as June 1794, Paris Senior had organized for a large British shipment of silver coins worth uh, around 600,000 uh, pounds to be received in Hamburg and sent on to Berlin from where the Prussian treasury would disperse it to soldiers in the field. 12 years and many lucrative deals later, Parrish Senior retired back to England and handed the banking business over to his sons, John and Charles. Nicholas had established a close working relationship with them during his time in Hamburg. Now they became his first port of call in all financial matters. Early in 1808, the brothers arranged an account under a false name on which Nicholas and anyone he authorized could draw. He ran up considerable debts with Parrish and Co. on account, uh, uh, quote, of secret service. The Foreign Office in London never questioned the sums and reimbursed the bankers reliably, if sometimes with considerable delay. The credit facility in Hamburg became a key channel through which Nicholas financed, financed his secret war. But the Parrish brothers were more than a correspondent bank for Britain's secret service. They provided intelligence and advice. They procured and delivered supplies to troops in the field. 
and they liaised with various German governments and the British. The French suspected as much and arrested John Parrish, re Parrish uh, repeatedly. Each time he was released promptly. Richard and David Parrish, his other brothers, had excellent contacts to the French government. Both were instrumental in organizing international transaction in much the same way for Napoleon from Paris and the Americas. The House of Paris, Parish was careful not to alienate any one of, Europeans, of Europe's great powers. The Parish brothers were by no means the only bankers who played this game. An entire generation of Anglo-German financiers rose through the prolonged conflict with Napoleon. London had been the mecca for merchants long before Napoleon came to power. As Jakob Garrels, offspring of one of the oldest Anglo-German merchant families, put it in January 1796, you could become independent and independently wealthy much faster in Britain than in Germany. Now these favourable circumstances, London's unrivaled global links, trading volumes and existing wealth, its function as the financial heart of Britain's industrialization and colonial expansion came together with a new set of opportunities. The prolonged conflict with France forced the British state to spend unprecedented sums. Only about a third of what it needed could be covered by taxes and duties. The remaining two thirds had to be raised through loans. Arranging these loans was one of the key activities of the merchant bankers. The majority of these funds then had to be channeled through uh, 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 clandestine networks to the armies and governments fighting the French in mainland Europe. In the course of the war, George III's government paid close to 66 million pounds in subsidies to foreign governments, roughly 3 billion in today's money. In the early years, this could be done by simply shipping coins and gold across the North Sea, but this became increasingly difficult and too risky. As the war moved into a new phase, there was more need than ever for funds to reach recipients on the continent reliably and quickly. Here too, the merchant bankers played a key role. Their credit and correspondence system meant that supplies for armies, salaries for soldiers, and subs subsidies for allied governments could be paid through third parties, offset by payments or contracts due elsewhere. It was also the merchant bankers who were able to organize the supplies needed in the field, be it foodstuffs, uniforms, horses, sabers or muskets. Drawing on a network of trusted partners across borders, the merchant houses had a golden opportunity to profit from every stage of the cycle through which the war was financed, from raising funds to making international payments to procuring supplies and having them delivered to wherever they were needed in the field. For Hamburg's merchants and bankers, the risk, however, was as high as the reward. Some of them, like the Parish brothers, became extraordinarily rich. Others, like Marianne Prell's uncle, were bankrupted. It was not only being discovered by the French that could break the back of Hamburg's traders, it was also the unpredictable fluctuation in prices. <clears throat> at the height of the smuggle trade, coffee could be sold in Hamburg at twice the London price. But when the tide of the war turned and the continental system became more and more porous, prices fell rapidly. For some traders too rapidly, they could no longer sell in Hamburg for the price at which they had bought from British merchants and went bankrupt. The fall of the smugglers' fortunes mirrored the decline of Napoleon's position in Europe. By February 1813, the Prussian king had joined the coalition against the French. His troops now fought together with Austrian, Russian, British, Swedish, Spanish and Portuguese forces. On the 13th of October, 1813, Russian forces captured Bremen. Three days later, the Battle of Leipzig began, which marked the end of Napoleon's rule in German-speaking Europe. Decisively defeated, his troops retreated towards France, 
only Hamburg, turned into a fortress under Marshal Davout, was held. In December 1813, more weapons were shipped from Britain for the troops involved in the siege of the city. It lasted until the end of May 1814, when Napoleon's troops finally left. During seven and a half years of occupation, Hamburg had remained closely linked with Britain. Despite the best efforts of Napoleon's soldiers, spies and police officers. But it would be wrong to extrapolate from Hamburg's experience to a generalized German experience. There was nothing like one Germany which would have fought in unison with Britain against France. Many in the educated classes, including Ferdinand Beneke in Hamburg, were pining for a united Germany. The more, the longer the war dragged on. But it would take half a century and another series of terrifying wars before a German nation state dominated by Prussia would come into existence. For much of the Napoleonic Wars, in contrast, there had been different Germanies following different interests in between greater powers. Only when it became overwhelmingly clear that the balance had turned against France, did the third Germany, those states in between Austria and Prussia, which had been loyal allies of Napoleon, switch sides. And even then, the unity of Germany against France remained brief. Too opposed were the long-term interests of the different German powers. In broader terms too, the impact of Napoleon on Anglo-German relations was immense, but not clear cut. The destructive forces unleashed by him had vastly different effects on the ways in which the various German states related to Britain. Northern ones such as Hamburg were desperately trying to build new ties across the North Sea. With their elites partially in British exile and what was left of their armies fighting under British colours. Here, the Napoleonic Wars created an extraordinary Anglo-German symbiosis, a dense network of officers, soldiers, agents, bankers and merchants who worked together to break Napoleon's rule and, in turn, deepened the ties that linked Britain and northwestern Germany. But the ruling elites and southern states, such as Bavaria and Saxony, had much more to lose from deserting Napoleon than they could expect to gain from joining Britain. They had been bribed and coerced by Napoleon, who had promoted their medium-sized states into kingdoms that fed his war machine with troops and depended on him for protection. Experiences had thus diverged widely across the diverse patchwork of the German uh, states. There were accordingly many ways in which Britain was seen in the German-speaking world. Ferdinand Benecke's ambivalent attitude towards die Engländer was echoed across the German lands in this sense. As ambivalent as the legacy of the Napoleonic Wars was for Britain's relationship with the German states, one fundamental fact was quite clear in the summer of 1815 as Napoleon, Napoleon's rule came to its final end. Britain had gone to unprecedented lengths to prevent one power from controlling mainland Europe. Napoleon had wanted Britain to be isolated, but no prime minister from Pitt to Liverpool had given in to that violent exclusionary vision. None of them had seen any benefit in Britain standing alone. Instead, they had done everything they could to regain access to the continent. They had raised armies, sent troops, subsidized allies and committed their country to fight Napoleon wherever possible. Eventually, they had succeeded by building coalitions and employing Britain's global economic and military power. In the process, Britain had become more, not less enmeshed with mainland Europe while maintaining and expanding, in fact, its position in the world. There was nothing to indicate that it would not do so again if another hegemonic power rose on the continent. Thank you very much.
Yeah, Jan Rüger, thank you very much indeed for this um, wide ranging and very clear cut talk that you provided us with. <clears throat> I mean, you said that uh, Napoleon's impact on Anglo German relations was immense but not clear cut. At the same time, I think you have managed to um, bring this uh, clear cutness into what you um, told us about. Um, we have obviously a question and answer session now. People will probably uh, wish to um, reflect on what um, you uh, have said. I would like to start perhaps our discussion by asking you about uh, one element that uh, you have not mentioned, you've mentioned so many things, it's always like this, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> namely the court civil. Um, I was wondering, um, as a uh, occupied territory, uh, shall we say, uh, the city and the country of Hamburg um, <clears throat> obviously was a beneficiary, was it not, from the court civil? Uh, like in like all other uh, occupied territories by Napoleon. That is to say, we would have had in Hamburg a competing system of the principles of the Court Civil <clears throat> on the one hand, and the influence of British liberalism on the way in which Hamburg functioned at the time. Do we have any indication whether this was at all discussed, whether this was an issue? Uh, I mean, in brackets, um, you mentioned uh, so importantly the bankers and the merchant bankers. Um, one of them, of course, was uh, uh, Salomon Heine, uh, Heine's uncle. And um, he would have benefited from one thing, namely from the Jewish emancipation that the court civil also mm. brought. Um, in what you have researched, did Salomon Heine play a role at all in all of this? <laughs> <laughs> that that would take half an hour and then probably half a year of research to 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 answer. But but um, it's 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 wonderful to to have all of that um, as an as an inspiration for for more. Um, uh, research. I, there was I thinking that chapter was was more, more or less uh, 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 drafted. Um, I haven't looked into Heine's uncle. Um, he didn't come up, um, uh, but I, I have no doubt um, uh, that you could not be a merchant in Hamburg at the time and not in one way or another participate in this. Um, uh, he may have just been cleverer than those who who made the news, as it were, um, uh, and and surface in the sources. Because as always, those are those are the ones who get into trouble. <clears throat> um, and the the fascinating thing is that while uh, French law is being introduced, uh, of course the Hamburgers continue um, uh, to trade um, uh, in in this clandestine fashion um, uh, with the British, uh, and they know full well that there is no law for that. Mm. Um, there's no there's no way in which you could. Uh, you know, there's no court for, 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 for any of that. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, there is that small island in the North Sea mm -hmm. um, through which much of this travel goes. So there's a small, there's small boats between Heligoland and Hamburg, and then larger boats between uh, Britain and, and Heligoland. Uh, and there you have um, a, a system which is also not quite um, a, a British nor quite German, but a, um, a, a weird and wonderful in between. Um, uh, mix of, of Germanic and, and English um, uh, law, um, utterly, utterly unpredictable. Um, uh, and there is a court. And so uh, you, you, but you can't ensure these, um, any, 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 um, uh, any, any of these transactions. Um, uh, so the Rothschilds, the Schroders, um, uh, everyone who participates in this, um, they say you, if you, if you want to um, document any of this, is it has to be the the, the, the expression is on a separate slip of paper, um, which can't be used in, in court, can't be used for anything, but still you want to somehow document it. Um, so it's absolutely fascinating, but it's, it, 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 the, the, the legal structures are, are not well documented for, for obvious reasons through which this, this works. Um, yes. Sorry, so, that was only a, a, a first step of an answer. No, no, perfect, <laughs> fine, wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, obviously, it was a kind of enforced double bookkeeping that they had to engage. Yes, that's in. it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, ladies and gentlemen, questions. Um, uh, <clears throat> as you have seen in the message, um, please use the chat or raise your hand. And um, Jana can enable you to speak. Anything? Right, so far not. Well, let's continue in this case. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, uh, come back to this uh, rather puzzling, at least it puzzles me always, this um, non-functioning alliance between Prussia and um, um, England um, as a follow-up to the coalition wars. I mean, the coalition wars against the revolution there one had a, I wouldn't say perfect alliance, but there was an alliance also between Prussia and, for example, Britain. Mm -hmm. One of the foundations was, of course, uh, going back to even, even Frederick the Great, uh, the Convention of Westminster, 1756. Mm -hmm. And um, why, after the, the, the end of the coalition wars, why was there no continuation, as far as you can see, between Prussia the young Frederick William the Fourth, the the third, uh, and of course George the Third. Why did this stop? Was it pipped? Uh, well, I think that you 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 have to you do have to look at at personalities. Um, mm. uh, so you've got a, a an inexperienced, weak is I don't like that that uh, 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 label, but you know he's usually described as a weak um, a Prussian uh, 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 king, unsure. Yeah. Uh, joining in some ways too late or, or too early, um, uh, committing his troops when, when Napoleon has just about defeated everyone else, um, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so personalities matter, yes. Um, but the broader strategic picture ultimately is decisive. Uh, so uh, when you ask, why wasn't there a convention of, uh, a repeat of a mm -hmm. convention of, of, of Westminster, mm -hmm. uh, then Frederick the Great essentially proved to the British that he could win uh, against the French. Mm -hmm. And did after he had done so, um, the British became more and more jubilant and more and more in favor of him mm -hmm. and renewed the subsidies um, mm -hmm. uh, and this, this uh, loveless, ill-fated, but, but um, functioning-ish um, uh, 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 marriage of between Prussia and and and, and Britain mm -hmm. um, that is the essential difference mm -hmm. so uh, against Napoleon Prussia is humiliated and a third ranking power mm -hmm. uh, Austria and Russia are the ones who do the the, the heavy lifting it is mm -hmm. only once Napoleon uh, has gone and limped back from Russia uh, and is then defeated um, uh, 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 by the by the uh, Austrians, or is is, is, then, is then clear that the Austrians are turning against him. Um, uh, even then, the Prussian king uh, uh, is, is hesitates, and only when his own generals are turning against him and say, "We we have to do this now," and are literally on the battlefield, um, are joining the coalition. That is when 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 he you know follows them essentially. Uh, in in a way, if you like, the the, the myth of of Waterloo mm. um, uh, is is really um, has has sort of clouded this this uh, this this quite clear cut strategic reality of Prussia being really a third ranking power in in, in all of this for most of the of of, of the wars. Mm. Um, you know, famously, Blücher came just in time to rescue um, uh, uh, the British at Waterloo, but from their perspective, he was about ten years late. Um, you know, they, they had expected something like a Frederick the Great and, and, and never got um, uh, any of that delivered on the, on, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is really only then that uh, when, when Prussia is strong enough to help that something like an alliance is, is, is possible. Mm -hmm. So the, the personalities matter hugely, but ultimately uh, they don't um, change the, the strategic uh, uh, reality in which Prussia is, is not able to withstand Napoleon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and therefore is not uh, uh, able to be a reliable alliance partner for, for Britain. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. <clears throat> we have a comment by uh, James uh, Vigus. Um, I just wanted to come back very briefly, if I may, just to com conclude this point. Um, what keeps puzzling me is indeed the time between the last coalition war and, shall we say, the period when Napoleon had not yet attacked um, Prussia. That uh, in this period, shall we say, between 1799 and 1804, that in that period nothing happened. But I think you just explained this because we have a relatively already then a very weak, indecisive Prussian king. Uh, we have a much more determined wife of his, uh, Königin Luise, <laughs> but uh, that's a different matter. Right. Let's move on to, to James's question. He would like to ask on the final point, isn't, the case, isn't it the case that the British government did become very isolationist uh, uh, by around the Congress of Verona? Uh, in 1822. Um, was that simply due to the end of Napoleonic conflict? <clears throat> so this is the, um, yeah, the self-isolation, as it were, that Britain yes. engages in after 15. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, that's roughly speaking right. Um, mm. it, it, it is fascinating when you go through, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm only halfway through the book. It, it begins with, with um, the future George the first traveling across the North Sea to be to be for for his coronation as 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 king of um, uh, Britain and he um, from from that point if you go through each and every um, uh, war that is being fought out in 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 Europe uh, you've got a similar uh, uh, scenario whenever the balance seems to be tilting in favor of one power, Britain does get involved. Mm. And it does not have to get involved in anything uh, in the 1820s. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's it, the, the Congress of Vienna sets up a comparably well functioning system, mm. um, not because it, it functions not because uh, everyone just goes home and, and self isolates, as it were. Um, but because uh, the the British, um, uh, as a leading um, uh, power, together with Russia, um, uh, but also together with, with with France, a rehabilitated France, and and the rest of uh, Europe, set up a a, a a mechanism, whether you call it concert or, or not, um, that is meant to to mediate, um, uh, and the the key principles um, on which this is based are that um, uh, borders are, are sacrosanct. So you, you can't shift borders, um, mm. uh, hence no war, and if, uh, a conflict is, is mediated between the great powers. That works quite well in the 1820s, so Britain doesn't have to pay much attention. It's really only um, uh, uh, when, with the in increasingly um, uh, problematic ways in which uh, Prussia and Austria are at loggerheads over the, the German question, um, that Britain needs to conceptualize something that has to do with, with one Germany um, uh, being at the, at the center of Europe, whether that is under Prussian leadership, under Austrian leadership, is, is open-ended in the 1830s and, and 40s um, are still. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the 1820s are unproblematic, but that doesn't mean that there's been a decisive shift um, uh, towards isolationism. Um, uh, and the, the idea that there are periods in which um, Britain is isolationist and periods when they are more uh, pro-European, as it were, um, periods in which they've got an imperial mindset and periods in which they've got a European mindset. I think this idea um, suffers um, uh, from the, 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 the way in which the chronology works out. If you look at it in detail, it is really only when they can afford to be isolationist uh, that they 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 never withdraw from Europe, but they play less of a of of an immediately interventionist um, uh, role. They're still very much uh, engaged diplomatically and strategically, of course. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, obviously, in the eighteen twenties, you have as the one problematic area you have uh, in Greece. Yeah, uh, um, that of course partly is due to the fact that. Um, Metternich in the Congress of Vienna failed to invite um, the Osman Empire. 
to participate and uh, there was uh, there was a problem but of course in britain we have we have then suddenly we have castlery as um, as an arch conservative and and he somehow cemented uh, a reactionary attitude in this country for for the time being basically until we had the the early traces of um, of victorian reforms um, but I don't want to deflect from, from, from Hamburg. I think this is such a fascinating thing what you've presented us with. Um, and the Hamburg gateway that becomes a trap for a certain while, and then at the same time, it becomes a surreptitious channel, uh, which I think you described so, so remarkably, um, with all these wheelings and dealings uh, on, a, on, a, on a trade basis, on a monetary system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you said that, um, shall we say, the Hamburg mentality, if there is such a thing, I'm, I'm sure there is such a thing. The Hamburg mentality, from your point of view, would you agree with Bernicke? Did it really suffer? Um, is this is was there clearly evidence of the moral decay in that sense? Uh, did one really only think in terms of the checkbooks, or what was going on from your perception? You you have to, of course, um, put this against the background of Benecke not being Hamburg born. So yeah. he's from Bremen originally. Yeah. Uh, he as a as a as a student, I think, as a 17, 18 year old, he, he moves to, to Hamburg and and uh, it's a uh, there is a there's an element of the newly arrived critiquing his 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 host uh, city as it as it were um, more brutally than than he may have done so if, mm -hmm. if if he had felt that he was one of them. But he was also he was not a merchant, although his father was. He was more of a, uh, if you like, a, a wannabe philosopher and uh, and a daylight uh, his day job um, uh, being a being as a as a lawyer and later a, a local um, politician. So he he is in that slightly insider outsider uh, position that that makes him critique the Hamburgers um, uh, more than than you know it's it's a slightly, um, but then it's also in the, the spirit of the time. You know if you if you. There, there was this cosmopolitan, uh, cultural, enlightened uh, admiration for Napoleon. Mm. And you accentuate, you express that admiration most uh, efficiently by offsetting it against those who are not like Napoleon. And that is the Hamburg merchants. They are not interested in anything grand, in anything um, uh, that, that has a whiff of genius or, or uh, the aspiration of, of you know, universalism. Um, they're, they're merchants, um, uh, very much like the English. Um, and so for Benecke, who, who himself aspires to something grander, um, uh, who would have loved to be a, a, a literary um, uh, light, um, mm -hmm. uh, and who was in touch and, and corresponded with, with many literary and philosophical figures. So he, he in a way, is, is in this double bind. He, he, it, it takes him a long time um, uh, to let go of Napoleon, as it were, uh, and and realize that his life too depends on on, on Britain. Hamburg's prosper prosperity does, uh, and so he begins to. Uh, I think it, there, there is also an element of of uh, regret. Um, he sees that his 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 brother is going. Uh, they're they're constantly in his diary. There are uh, uh, accounts of of money. There not being enough money of debt of of um, financial uh, worries. Um, and so those who do better out of this situation are, 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 are in his, you know, are, 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 he critiques them more than they perhaps uh, uh, deserve. Um, but the, the overall ment mentality, I mean, I, I wouldn't go, you know, I wouldn't dare to uh, describe uh, the, the, the Hamburg mentality. Um, but I'm, I, I'm sure that most of the merchants would have, would have nodded, would have agreed with him and say, yes, yeah, no, genius and, and universalism is not for us. Mm. Um, uh, for us, it's the bottom line every evening. Um, uh, and, and if that means pragmatism, if that means uh, compromise, if that means dealing with the French and the British on a daily basis as well as we can, um, so may it be. Um, uh, there, there, you know, there is no grand vision. There is no 
no no great philosophical line involved in 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 that um yes thank you we have a question from our colleague edward hughes um and it's regarding the uh, responses within the german lands to the situation regarding uh, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. Mm. Any indications on that front? Uh, that's a really good question. And I, I, that would be a, a lovely long essay or chapter you could, you could do. Um, uh, I, I haven't looked at it. I need to be just, just honest. Um, uh, from what I read in Benica's diaries, um, it plays a big role, not just for him. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know the 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 moment at which the revolution betrays its own ideals as they see it they see Napoleon at, at that point still as the um, the Stadthalter they often call him of the revolution um, uh, and so uh, for for the Napo for the revolution to betray its own ideals um, uh, that is the, the the key point for for, for them. Um, but I haven't looked into this in any in any broader context. I, I would love to, and it's a really really good research question, actually. So it sorry, is. for a slightly evasive answer. Just a footnote from a literary historian on that front. Um, Heinrich von Kleist is an interesting case here, because uh, he devoted a novella on the subject, and it's the betrothal of San Domingo. Of course, yes. uh, very controversial nowadays. Very controversial text but uh, an extraordinary text, as you would expect from Heinrich von Kleist. Um, and uh, he's, of course, the one who takes the double perspective as well, mm -hmm. um, namely as someone who at least pretends to utterly hate Napoleon, and at the same time got the printing license for the German version of the, of the Code Civil in Dresden. Yeah. Um, but he writes this novella and um, as, as is, this is the interesting thing, you know, bringing historians and literary scholars together, because the um, the literary scholars, the Kleistians, so to speak, um, they tend to ignore that there was an atmosphere in Germany, as you demonstrated through Bernicke's uh, comments and diaries on the subject, um, that would have encouraged Kleist to write a story about this. Mm -hmm. Normally one sees the Kleist novella as a piece of literature full stop and says how extraordinary that he writes about this, end of story. I'm only slightly exaggerating. But one does not take into account as far as, as um, uh, Kleist scholarship, at least of, of recent years is concerned, to my knowledge, they don't tend to take into account this particular atmosphere that you described so uh, so interestingly, caused and reflected by someone like um, Bernicke. So um, indeed, this is quite a big a big question because uh, one tends to look at also in terms of other literary production of of the time. One tends to look at Kleist in isolation. And it would be really fascinating to see whether there is more stuff that actually also, from a literary point of view, reflected this uh, Haitian uh, uprising. Yes. I would say that's a that that it would be a beautiful bit of bit of research to do. Yeah. And and you're right. I I I think um, you know there has to be an audience for that yeah. novella exactly. and an audience for whom the both the exoticism um, uh, and the and the romance, but also the political relevance of that place um, uh, is is clear. Yes. Um, uh, uh, is, is is there um, and you know Kleist doesn't need to explain all of that um, uh, uh, but that's that's a really a really brilliant point thank you yeah no thank you to um, to to Eddie for this um, James comes back James Vibes comes back with a question literary travelers from Britain uh, e.g. Wollstonecraft tended to stigmatize the Hamburg mentality as Philistine mutual ambivalence I suppose thank you for the fascinating talk and you reply to my first question. Indeed, would you like to uh, say something on that too, on the stigmatization of the Hamburg mentality, since we talked about mentality just now a little bit? Well, I think that's just a, you know, a, 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 a cabinet of mirrors, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But thank you for the comment, thank you. Absolutely, yes, fine, thank you, James. Right, I think uh, I can't see any further comments or questions or hands. Uh, we can only applaud, applaud to you, uh, Jan Rüger, for a fascinating talk. 
And it just illustrated yet again uh, how important it is that we get the historical data right and the interpretation <laughs> of it. I think that's absolutely crucial. Uh, thank you so much. And thank, you. So, thank you for having me. Not at all. And we look forward to reading it. OK, thank you, Thanks thank very you much. all very much for attending. It was great to have you around and um, I'll see you next month um, or even before then. Fine. Thank you all. Thank Bye you for now. Right.